When campaigning against marijuana in the 1930s, Harry Anslinger loved telling the story of the original assassins. As the story goes, the Persian group under the control of the old man of the mountain named Hassan Ibn al-Sabah. Ibn stands for the son of. I learned that from the Muslim Felia Rania here. I had to ask her how to pronounce the name and she told me that, oh, Ibn means for that. So got some nice trivia there. Hassan, the son of Sabah. He had their fear of death removed by drinking hashish, uh, which is, of course, a cannabis extract. And this is what removed their inhibitions for slaughtering people. And as a result, they carried out orders for Hassan without question in a way so absolute that it would make modern military leaders jealous. Hassan used his assassins to plunder and terrorize Persia. Marco Polo told this original story, and Hassan would initiate new recruits by feeding them hashish until they passed out, and then he would have them transported into a beautiful palace garden he had designed, and in the garden there were gorgeous women and delicacies, just tantalizing these, these young men, um, uh, representing the eternal rewards that would come from obeying Hassan, and additionally, Actors would be buried up to their necks with pools of blood poured around them so that they would look like severed heads that were able to talk. So the actors posing as severed heads would tell the recruits about the afterlife and how to get there. So the garden essentially represented heaven and blindly following Hassan was the way to gain access. And finally, they would be fed Ashish again until they passed out and they were removed from the garden, newly loyal to their master, Hassan. The story, of course, is apocryphal. It was a legend retold by Marco Polo, and the story evolved so that Hashish uh, eventually was, was supposedly directly responsible for the violence caused by the assassins. They'd take the Hashish before going into battle and it'd be, make them crazy and violent and murderous, right? So according to some versions of the story, the word assassin is derived from the word hashish, as in hash hashins. Though uh, this is n not accepted by everybody, other people claim that assassin is simply derived from the name Hassan. Whatever version of the story is true, if any, doesn't really matter. In the history of marijuana in the United States, this story was a favorite of Harry Anslinger to show people how dangerous marijuana was. And in a testimony against marijuana, Anslinger said, quote, in Persia, a thousand years before Christ, there was a religious and military order founded which was called the Assassins, and they derived their name from the drug called Hashish, which is now known in this country as marijuana. They were noted for their acts of cruelty, and the word Assassin very aptly describes the drugs. I'm Chris Calton, and this is the Mises Institute Podcast Historical Controversies. Today I'm going to be talking about one of libertarianism's favorite controversies, marijuana, and specifically the origins of marijuana criminalization, which is just a fascinating history and one of the starkest examples of the dangers and immorality of government. So the first law regulating marijuana, as well as cocaine and opium, was the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, and this required products uh, to list marijuana as an intoxicating ingredient. So it was just a mild regulation at the time, um, and but this legislation paved way for the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914 that made it illegal for non-medical consumers to possess cocaine or opiates. Now, marijuana was not criminalized as a part of the Harrison Narcotics Act, but it was included in the early drafts of the law, but it was removed because it had so many important medical uses, so marijuana remained legal at the federal level for another 23 years. The majority of marijuana users in the country at this time were either black or Mexican, and the earliest laws passed against uh, marijuana were designed as a pretext for harassing Mexicans, blacks, and Indians, being immigrants from India, not Native Americans. Uh, so Henry J. Finger, who was a member of the California Board of Pharmacy, wrote a letter in 1911 saying that within the last year, we in California have been getting a large influx of Hindus, and they have in turn started quite a demand for cannabis indica. They are a very undesirable lot, and the habit is growing in California very fast. The fear is now that it is not being confined to the Hindus alone, but that they are initiating our whites into this habit. So this was essentially the beginning of the uh, political fears, the political demagoguery of 
racial stigmatization of marijuana uh, that that was being driven to pass legislation against the corruption of of whites uh, by these minorities. Um, Mexicans and blacks would be the big specters. But of course, in uh, California, where you had Indian immigrants and they had cannabis indica, cannabis indica. Uh, grew primarily in the Middle East. This is a bit of an aside, but it's interesting uh, history. Whereas cannabis sativa, which would grow more in warmer climates, that's what we actually had coming up from Mexico, which was the bulk of marijuana uh, up until the 70s. And when Nixon started pushing the Mexican government to spray Paraquat on the uh, Mexican marijuana plants in the 1970s. A bunch of hippies went out on the old hashish trail in the Middle East and they brought back cannabis indica, which um, would grow better in colder climates. So that's actually what you see predominantly in the black market today is cannabis indica because it grows in more areas of the United States. But at this time, cannabis indica was not very common. It was only used by, uh, predominantly used, I should say, by Indian immigrants, whereas um, Mexicans and uh, African Americans predominantly used uh, cannabis sativa that came up from Mexico, Caribbean, and uh, South America. So California established itself as the pioneering state for bad ideas early on by criminalizing marijuana in 1913. So California was the first state to criminalize marijuana, and this was a year before the Harrison Narcotics Act was passed. Now, in 1907, they had also criminalized opium and cocaine, so they proceeded um, all the federal laws on drugs. So marijuana did not precede cocaine and opium and criminalization in California, but uh, California preceded the, the national government in, in all three drugs. Texas was the, the next to follow. El Paso, the city of El Paso, passed a bylaw in 1914 that outlawed marijuana because it incited violence. This was their claim. The city had a large population of blacks and Mexicans, and it was no secret that anti-cannabis laws were racially motivated. So in, in 1990, 19, when the state Senate in Texas was debating a statewide uh, anti-marijuana law, there was one uh, Texas state senator uh, who said, and I'm quoting here, all Mexicans are crazy and this stuff, marijuana, is what makes them crazy. So in 1919, Texas criminalized marijuana as well. So with this precedent set, Southern and Western states in particular started lobbying for federal legislation as a means of targeting racial minorities. There was a politician in Montana arguing for a law similar to that in Texas who claimed that, and again I'm quoting, give one of these Mexican beet filled workers a couple of puffs on a marijuana cigarette and he thinks he is in the bullring at Barcelona. Barcelona's in Spain, so it's kind of a, a silly, silly comparison in the first place. So this kind of racism and demagoguery was not isolated to political speeches. I want to read an excerpt from the New York Times article from July 6th, 1927, that helped establish some of these early misconceptions about marijuana that were used to justify its criminalization. The headline read, Mexican family goes insane. So a very good gripping headline. And it was a story about a family living in Mexico City. And it read, here's the passage, it said, a widow and her four children have been driven insane by eating the marijuana plant, according to doctors, who say that there is no hope of saving the children's lives and that the mother will be insane for the rest of her life. The tragedy occurred while the body of the father, who had been killed, was still in a hospital. The mother was without money to buy other food for her children, whose ages range from 3 to 15, so they gathered some herbs and vegetables growing in the yard for their dinner. Two hours after the mother and children had eaten the plants, they were stricken. Neighbors, hearing outbursts of crazed laughter, rushed to the house to find the entire family insane. Examination revealed that the narcotic marijuana was growing among the garden vegetables. Now, we know, of course, today that cannabis does not make people insane, but if you remember from the previous episode, this fear had already been raised in an investigation in the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission in Britain that refuted the notion that cannabis caused insanity in 1893. And this was information that the United States had access to, obviously, as there were already international drug conferences taking place in the first decade of the 20th century. The international drug conferences um, are mostly revolved around opium. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, the idea that they didn't have this information is, is unlikely. In 1931, another anti-marijuana warrior came into the scene, and his name was, he was a doctor named A.E. Fossier. 
whose motivations to get marijuana criminalized were also openly racist. He wrote an article entitled The Marijuana Menace, which was published in the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal. I'll read another passage from this. He said, The debasing and baneful influence of hashish and opium is not restricted to individuals, but has manifested itself in the nations and races as well. The dominant race and most enlightened countries are alcoholic, whilst the races and nations addicted to hemp and opium, some of which once attained to heights of culture and civilization, have deteriorated both mentally and physically. Excuse me, I had trouble not laughing while I was reading some of that. Uh, remember that Remember that this was back when prohibition was still in effect. So Fosier was saying that the great race, being whites, drank alcohol, while the inferior races, everybody else, used either opium or cannabis. And it was no coincidence that this was the case. And as if the absurdity of this conclusion w wasn't apparent enough, he was observing New Orleans in the late 1920s while writing this article. And there, the vast majority of the people arrested for narcotics were U.S.-born whites. They didn't have a very large Mexican population there. Um, so most of the arrestees were white. So he, he literally just fabricating um, his, his observations. And so the fear of white women being seduced by cannabis users was drummed up by a Canadian feminist named Emily Murphy, writing under the pseudonym, I love her pseudonym, Janie Canuck. And so Maclean's magazine asked her to write some pieces on the Canadian drug problem, and much of what she wrote was simply taken from American publications. Anybody who used drugs, according to Murphy, was just trying to seduce white women, uh, white Christian women, as part of an international conspiracy of Chinese and blacks who wanted to control, and I'm quoting here from one of her articles, the bright-browed races of the world. She told the story, quoting another passage, of an addict who died this year in British Columbia who told how he was frequently jeered at as a white man accounted for. This man belonged to a prominent family. The common go-to is these are upper-class, well-to-do white people. So this man belonged to a prominent family and used to relate how the Chinese peddlers taunted him with their superiority at being able to sell the dope without using it. And by telling him how the yellow race would rule the world, they would strike at the white race through dope and when the time was ripe would command the world. Some of the Negroes coming into Canada, and they are no fiddle-faddle fellows either, have similar ideas, and one of the greatest writers has boasted how ultimately they will control the white men. And in another article, she perpetuated the insanity myth as well. She wrote, Persons using marijuana smoke, the dried leaves of the plant, which has the effect of driving them completely insane. The addict loses all sense of moral responsibility. Addicts to this drug, while under its influence, are immune to pain, become raving maniacs, and are liable to kill or indulge in any form of violence to other person. Now, this is the same kind of stuff we hear about uh, meth addicts today, and it's also the stuff we'll find out in the cocaine episode was used um, to, to argue that cocaine addicts um, were not stoppable by typical police bullets, so we had to get higher caliber bullets in our police guns because of the, the uh, cocaine-addled drug addict. So, of course, these are the same lies that have been told for decades, decades now. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that at the time of her writing these articles, cannabis was really non-existent in Canada. So she was pulling most of this from um, American publications, but her writing still strongly contributed to the changing uh, of the opinion of drug users as victims, the sy sympathetic view, to the hostile opinion of drug users being a danger to civilized society. And Canada ended up criminalizing marijuana in 1923, which was a decade before marijuana would even be imported into Canada. So another scene, uh, the jazz scene, was the primary source of negatively associating cannabis with blacks in the 1920s. Louis Armstrong famously loved marijuana, but the most interesting story is that of Armstrong's marijuana dealer named Milton Mesro, who went by the nickname Mez. So this is a bit of an aside, but I think the story is just too good not to tell. So Mez was not black. He was a Jewish kid from Chicago. But when he was a teenager, he got busted trying to steal a car. And he got sent to a reform school where he made friends with some black musicians. And while he was there, he basically decided that he was going to become a Negro. These are his words. He learned how to play the saxophone to become a, mu a jazz musician, but he wasn't very good. But he made a name for himself as a supplier of marijuana for the jazz music scene. 
Now, if you're familiar with this person, Rachel Dolezal, who has gained attention for being a white woman who identifies as black and people are calling her the first transracial person. Sorry, Rachel. Mezzi Mesro has you beat by decades. In 1940, he was actually listed by the Army Draft Board as a Negro. And this just delighted him to no end. Uh, So marijuana was a part of the jazz culture at the time and they genuinely thought this made them better musicians now whether or not this is true i'll leave up to people who listen to jazz which i don't but the fact that they believed that cannabis had this effect was important in this history so jazz clubs were also significant because they were a place in which the races intermingled quite a bit louis armstrong was the first black musician to play on stage with white musicians and jazz clubs enjoyed a mixture of black and white patrons so now you had cannabis associated with racial mixing which was just horrifying to many people at the time you might also argue that marijuana was the way that blacks coped with racism at the time keep in mind this is a time when southern cities would still advertise in newspapers the public lynching of black people and then the people attending would sell postcards of the events to their friends so louis armstrong when talking about marijuana he once said it makes you feel good man it relaxes you makes you forget all the bad things to happen to a negro Uh, So there were racial motivations behind every aspect of marijuana use, and this all meant the buildup of ammunition against legal marijuana use that would be used by the godfather of the war on drugs, a man named Harry Anslinger. So Harry Anslinger is often credited as the man who created the move to get marijuana criminalized, but he was really building largely on anti-marijuana ideas that were already in place. What he really did was bring these ideas all together into a widespread national narrative that would finally culminate in a countrywide ban on marijuana. Uh, So there's a lot of elements to this story, and I'm going to try to to touch on all of them because I think they're important. So on August 12th, 1930, the government created the Federal Bureau of Narcotics uh, within the U.S. Treasury Department. The original Harrison Narcotics Act did not create a prohibition of narcotics. It just required doctors and pharmacists to keep records of their drugs and to pay a stamp tax on them. So the Treasury Department was given enforcement powers to collect these taxes, which is why the FBN was part of the Treasury Department. Harry Anslinger was appointed as the first head of the FBN and would stay there until 1962. Anslinger was every bit the rival of J. Edgar Hoover and his newly created FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I consider it a pretty big oversight in the typical historical narrative that Anslinger isn't viewed as being of similar importance today, especially given the remarkable consequences of the war on drugs that Anslinger gave birth to. J. Edgar Hoover wanted to bolster the reputation of his agency by targeting enemies of the state, and Anslinger responded by targeting drug addicts and organized crime. Now, obviously, J. Edgar Hoover won that battle for notoriety, um, but again, Anslinger's legacy is ongoing, so he is more important than history makes him out to be. Part of Anslinger's strategy for building up the importance of his department was to tackle cannabis once and for all. And if you look up quotes from Anslinger on his killer weed, as he called it, they're absolutely laughable today. But people actually took him quite seriously at the time. One of the common pieces of demagoguery that you'll find is when Anslinger famously said, If the hideous monster Frankenstein came face to face with the monster marijuana, he would drop dead of fright. And this was published in the Washington Herald in 1937, the same year that marijuana was made illegal. But when he first became head of the FBN in 1930, Anslinger was not voicing this rhetoric. In fact, uh, he really didn't see cannabis as a threat at all and was quite dismissive of it. So uh, the question is, why did he change his tune and start attacking marijuana? And for that, there are two general theories, one of which sounds a bit more of a conspiracy theory, but it does have enough circumstantial evidence and is still sufficiently well circulated that it's still worth covering. So the first theory is the least conspiratorial, and it offers a very Rothbardian explanation behind Anslinger's action because it assumes political motivation. When the FBN was first formed, it only had 300 agents working under Anslinger, So even if he wanted to tackle marijuana, he simply didn't have the resources. 
Instead, he told the states to handle the marijuana problem themselves, but this wasn't satisfactory to a lot of people, especially during the Great Depression when Mexican immigrants were seen to be taking the jobs of white people, and state-level marijuana laws were used as the justification for the deportation of Mexicans uh, without, many of them didn't even have actual evidence uh, that they had used marijuana, but it was just a, a justification for their deportation because of the the job stealing, uh, you know, beliefs of the Great Depression. So we had a com combination of interests. The people in the states with large Mexican populations were driven by anti-Mexican and anti-immigrant sentiments, and they saw marijuana laws as the solution to what was really an economic problem. In California, where marijuana was already illegal, this was a particularly apparent phenomenon. Uh, one leading Californian member of the American Coalition of Patriotic Societies, his name was C.M. Goeth, uh, he wrote an article in the New York Times in 1935 where he said, reading a passage here, marijuana, perhaps now the most insidious of our narcotics, is a direct byproduct of unrestricted Mexican immigration. Easily grown, it has been asserted that it has recently been planted between rows in a Californian penitentiary garden. Mexican peddlers have been caught distributing sample marijuana cigarettes to school children. And there was, of course, no substantiating evidence for any of this, but that mattered little to the other interested parties. And the state legislators were motivated by these interests in order to appease their constituents. But one of the biggest culprits in the anti-marijuana campaign was the media. And in particular, uh, I'm talking about William Randolph Hearst, who is credited with being the newspaper publisher who drove us into the Spanish-American War for his misleading reporting dubbed Yellow Journalism, which he applied heavily in his anti-marijuana campaign. He was the person who actually popularized the term marijuana, which was spelled with an H instead of a J. If you ever look in any old publications, you're going to see uh, the, the old marijuana spelled with an H much more commonly. Um, before this, Americans typically referred to marijuana as hemp, which we now pretty much reserve for um, low THC cannabis used for industrial purposes. So we think of hemp as the industrial product, marijuana as the uh, recreational product and cannabis would be the technical term, but Hearst and Anslinger as well focused on the word marijuana because they, I guess they saw cannabis and hemp as being too innocuous. Americans were familiar with the terms cannabis and hemp and they associated uh, them with medicine um, predominantly. So the, the term marijuana, which, um, you know, was uh, supposedly the, the Mexican term for it, it was again just part of this anti-Mexican sentiment. But Anslinger was particularly motivated to jump on the anti-marijuana bandwagon when the FBN's budget was just cut tremendously in 1934 due to a drop in tax revenues from the Great Depression. So as this interpretation of his motivation goes, and I believe that it's it's plausible one, this, this one I think is, is, is probably predominantly true, he started to lobby for Congress to pass a law against the marijuana menace which would, of course, be enforced by a well-funded Federal Bureau of Narcotics. The other theory is a bit more conspiratorial, but it's not entirely implausible, and it offers a corporatist explanation of Anslinger's motivations. In fact, if you've seen the Family Guy episode, it's not a very good episode, but it's the one in which Brian is trying to get marijuana legalized. Uh, the explanation he gives for its original criminalization is this conspiratorial explanation. So this actually originated in 1972 when Jack Hare was first showed rolling papers that were made out of hemp. And he was just shocked to discover that there were uses for marijuana plant other than getting high. Like You can use this for other things. I mean, it's good enough as it is. He thought he was a big, big drug user. He, um, a lot of his revelations in this theory were actually uh, inspired by LSD hallucinations, supposedly. So again, there's a lot of reasons to question this theory just from uh, the source of uh, the source of the the revelations and the ideas behind it. Uh, but uh, he decided that he did want to learn as much as he could about the industrial qualities of hemp. And during his investigations, he found two interesting articles. One was a study published by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1916 that talked about the future of hemp harvesting due to a new machinery that would make hemp products more efficient to produce. And the study projected that hemp was on track to become the nation's largest cash crop, supplanting cotton. 
Uh, so the other article he found was a 1938 popular mechanics piece that pretty much just corroborated the 1916 study uh, two decades later. And this article was titled New Billion Dollar Crop. Now, of course, this had all been cut short by the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, which was sold to Congress with the promise that it would never criminalize industrial hemp. But that promise was, of course, quickly broken. So Herr decided he wanted answers as to why this economic innovation was put to death. And he blamed one of America's wealthiest families, the DuPonts. The DuPonts, whether Harris theory is true or not, certainly benefited from the criminalization of industrial hemp because they had patented a synthetic nylon fiber that could have been replaced by cheap industrial hemp. So Hare claimed that, and I'm quoting here, if hemp had not been made illegal, 80% of DuPont's business would never have materialized. Now, I mentioned that that's a direct quote, mostly just because I have no idea where he pulled the 80% number from. It might have been just completely arbitrary, but but it, it is very true that um, hemp would have edged in to their market share. Uh, it is a very useful industrial product. And it's interesting to note, too, um, many people listening to this probably already know this, but it's worth mentioning that uh, hemp products, of course, are not illegal in the country. Only uh, hemp itself is illegal. So countries where it's still legal to grow hemp, um, even countries that have uh, like recreational cannabis being illegal, some of them are still allowed to grow industrial hemp. And so then they make the products and export them uh, to our country where we can buy the products, but we can't manufacture them. So just th something to think about in terms of the impact on the economy, because a lot of our southern states are really well suited for for hemp growing. So where the conspiratorial connection to Anslinger comes in, DuPont's primary financial backer was Andrew Mellon. And he's another one of the uh, of America's wealthiest people at the time who served as Treasury Secretary during the time when marijuana um, was under talks to be made illegal. Uh, he was he was Coolidge's and Hoover's Treasury Secretary. Uh, so in the early 30s. And remember, the Treasury Department was in charge of enforcing narcotics laws because they were based on taxes rather than explicit prohibitions. But Mellon was more than just Ann Slinger's boss. Uh, Anslinger actually married Andrew Mellon's favorite niece, so they were related to each other uh, through marriage, loosely, as well as Anslinger, of course, reporting directly to Andrew Mellon. And so Hare's theory also involves William Randolph Hearst. So the smear campaign against marijuana that Hearst was waging in the media, Hare believed was motivated by Hearst's... Uh, uh, property holdings in timber, which also would have lost value if hemp became cheaper to harvest. And because Hearst was able to supply his own newspapers with um, the paper they needed to print on, this would upset his entire field of business. Now, the problem with Hare's theory is that he never actually proves any of these motivations directly, that they drove any of the key players in their anti-marijuana campaigns. This is all pretty much the Anslinger's connection to Mellon, Mellon's interest in DuPont, and Hearst's investment in timber. They're, they're all very interesting pieces of circumstantial evidence. All that stuff is absolutely true. That's not contested. Uh, but it's just circumstantial. It wouldn't hold up in court, right? So the real importance of this theory is that it was and still is taken seriously by very many people. So regardless of whether Anslinger's motivations were political, corporate, both or neither, suddenly he saw marijuana as the gravest threat to America and Hearst was his biggest ally in the media. And among the arguments that Anslinger made to sell the criminalization of marijuana were that, and I'm quoting directly here, marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes. And Anslinger depicted jazz clubs that had blacks and whites intermingling and Hearst backed him up by describing the, quote, voodoo satanic music that was played at the clubs by musicians while they were high on marijuana. The depiction of white women being endangered by marijuana smokers was one of the most popular narratives in segregated America. In a 1937 article written by Anslinger entitled Assassin of Youth, he gave this depiction of a marijuana eviction. Uh, so I'm quoting a passage from his article here. The sprawled body of a young girl lay crushed on the sidewalk the other day after a plunge from the fifth story of a Chicago apartment house. Everyone calls it suicide, but actually... It was murder. The killer was a narcotic known to America as marijuana and history as hashish. 
It is a narcotic used in the form of cigarettes, comparatively new to the United States and as dangerous as a coiled rattlesnake. So, of course, this is just demagoguery in a nutshell. And Hearst contributed to this narrative by celebrating the success of, of more enlightened countries, such as fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. So one of his headlines in a Hearst paper read, Mussolini leads way in crushing dope devil. And he also published articles from Nazi leaders explaining how the Third Reich's combating of drugs contributed to the cause of racial purity. And this was, of course, at a time when there, there was still a following of, of fascists uh, and, uh, and Nazis in the country, um, which uh, was, was not entirely uncommon until the American entry into World War II. Anslinger also claimed that 50% of all the crimes associated with ethnic minorities could be traced to marijuana use, and the original depiction of marijuana's effect was that it made people incredibly violent. In 1936, a story by the Universal News Service reported that, and I'll read a passage here again, murders due to killer drug marijuana sweeping the United States. Shocking crimes of violence are increasing. Murder, slaughtering, cruel mutilations, maiming, done in cold blood, as if some hideous monster was a muck in the land. Much of this violence is attributed to what experts call marijuana. It is another name for hashish, a roadside weed in almost every state in the Union. Those addicted lose all restraints, all inhibitions. They become bestial demoniacs filled with a mad lust to kill. Harry Anslinger's favorite story was... Uh, that of a young man named Victor Lakato. So this is another story about the violence of marijuana. And Victor Lakato lived in Tampa, Florida. And at the age of 21, he murdered his parents, his two brothers, and his sister with an axe. And he supposedly claimed to the police that he did all this while in a marijuana dream. This is as Anslinger tells the story. The story of Lakato's murders were true, but Anslinger completely fabricated the use of marijuana, which is not mentioned even one time in his records. And Anslinger also omitted the fact that he had a history of mental illness and the police had already tried to commit him to a mental asylum. Now, despite these gross misrepresentations of the facts, Anslinger told this story over and over again. And it's also worth mentioning, I didn't put this in my notes either, but I should have. During the, the Cold War, when that started being drummed up, this is years after marijuana was criminalized, which is why it's not in this portion that I want to take place before 1937. But Anslinger sold marijuana as something that just made people crazed and violent. But when the Cold War was ramping up, he actually changed his tune uh, entirely to say that marijuana makes people passive and it would make it easy for the, the communists to come and invade and take over the country because all the marijuana addicts would basically be defenseless because they're so lazy and passive. So marijuana, uh, uh, Harry Anslinger, excuse me, he just completely did a 180 on his narrative about the effects of marijuana entirely for the purpose of appealing to the political winds at the time. So some of the other horrors that Anslinger and the media reported about marijuana use were sexual licentiousness. An article published in the International Digest in 1937 entitled The Menace of Marijuana told the horrifying account of a boy and girl who had lost their senses so completely after smoking marijuana that they actually eloped and were married. That's a direct quote from the article. It's just a horrifying thing that these people eloped. And another piece in the same year described the scene of a high school orgy instigated by marijuana use. So Anslinger's propaganda campaign included the commissioning of several films against marijuana as well. The titles of these films include uh, the first one released in 1935, which just entitled Marijuana, but it had this wonderful tagline. It said, weird orgies, wild parties, unleashed passions. And another was the movie version of Anslinger's story, Assassin of Use. This actually came out a year after, if I remember correctly, it came out a year after, um, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, so I believe it was a 1938 release, but he was still, I mean, pushing the propaganda pretty much through his entire career. Um, but the most famous of all these movies was called Tell Your Children, and it was also released under the title The Burning Question, The Dope Addict, Doped Youth, Love Madness, and the, the infamous name by which most people know it today, Reefer Madness. <laughs> 
Now, Reefer Madness was a film that followed the lives of several students who succumbed to the evils of marijuana and each had different fates from suicide to sexual depravity to insanity. So it was really just kind of like combining all these narratives that Anslinger had been crafting. And the story was just a bomb at the box office. Nobody really was that interested in it um, from a private consumer level. But it was played to high schoolers for decades. My dad actually told me he was he was shown this. I think when he was in high school in the the seventies, he he was shown this. So it was it was uh, go, it was still circulating for quite some time. And eventually, it died off into obscurity until it was uncovered by the pro legalization group Normal, which stands for National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And they colorized it and circulated it ironically as a pro-legalization piece of propaganda by showing how absurd the basis of marijuana laws were in the first place. So if you actually see the, the, the version that you'll usually see is the normal version, it's colorized and they actually blow like, like purple and green smoke when they're smoking the marijuana. So, so some of the absurdity of the film is added by normal, but even without that, you know, weird colorization, it was just an absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous film. If you ever watch it, it's, it's, Almost funny, uh, but also a little hard to sit through because it's, you know, made in 1936. Uh, When the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 actually was presented to Congress, it took only two one-hour meetings to decide it. And it was unceremoniously signed into law by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, just one more reason not to like the guy. Uh, And when it was being sold to Congress, it was promised that both the medical use of marijuana and the industrial use of hemp would be unimpaired. In fact, the one dissenter when when uh, testifying in front of Congress for this law was a doctor who claimed that and, and he was right about this, but he was told he was wrong. He claimed that it would completely end the medical use of marijuana. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, So even though Congress um, was told that it wouldn't affect the medical use or the the industrial use, they didn't read the law when it was passed. So, and of course, that's no surprise. So the actual text in the law would allow Anslinger's FBN to use the force of the law against both um, the industrial and medicinal uses of marijuana. So most of this was because of the way the tax act worked. And it was that to legally hold marijuana, you had to obtain a stamp from the government. But the way that you got this stamp was that you had to take your marijuana to an appointed official and show them that you already had the marijuana. You couldn't get the stamp if you didn't already have marijuana. But if you had the marijuana before you had the stamp, you were a criminal and could be arrested. So if you read the book Catch-22, this is genuinely what the government was doing after 1937. In 1969, the Marijuana Tax Act would finally be struck down as unconstitutional when Timothy Leary, the high priest of LSD, was busted for marijuana in 1966. And his case went all the way to the Supreme Court where his lawyers argued that requiring a person to show the marijuana in order to obtain a stamp Uh, By doing this, the law violated the Fifth Amendment because it required people to self-incriminate. And the justices agreed. So the Tax Act was thrown out on May 19th, 1969. But the federal government, of course, ever unwilling to give up power, simply responded by passing the Controlled Substances Act, which was part of the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act, on October 27th, 1970. And this law established drug scheduling and it immediately listed marijuana as a Schedule One drug, meaning that it was dangerous and had absolutely zero medical benefits. And this, of course, is the law that still regulates marijuana today. So I feel like I could do an entire series of episodes on marijuana alone. I cut out a lot of the social and cultural stuff and it's very interesting history. Um, There's some wonderful books on the history of marijuana for people that are interested. But I focus mostly on the political stuff because I think that's what appeals mostly to the group of people that will be listening to a Mises Institute podcast and also the stuff that I think is is the most important. And uh, the next episode, do subscribe to this podcast because you're not going to want to miss it. I'm going to talk about uh, a similar history with heroin and then after that, the similar history of cocaine. So each one of these drugs has its own individual and very, very fascinating history and its relationship to the government. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And thanks for listening. For more content like this, visit Mises.org.